Hi everybody and welcome to a new video in the Generative Music AI course. Last time we took a look at the difference between symbolic and audio generation. Today we're going to look at some generative music techniques. This is not going to be a super detailed review of different techniques, but rather it's going to give you a high level of review because we're still in part one of the course. It's called Foundations and we want to address both musicians and engineers. So what topic are we going to cover today? In particular, we're going to look at a taxonomy of different generative music techniques. Then we're going to dive deep into each category of the taxonomy, take a look at an example for each category. And finally, I'm going to leave you with some resources that you can use to get deeper in whatever we are discussing today. Here's a meme for you coming directly from Dali. And as you can see, Dali still has some problems dealing with text. I'll do everything to generate music. Well, it's music. But the point that I want to make is that throughout history, researchers in generative music have tried all sorts of generative music techniques or generative techniques that they drew from artificial intelligence. The only thing they haven't tried is throwing the kitchen sink at generative music, but they would do that if they could. Now, the whole history of generative music can be literally summarized in this simple diagram. You choose a technique and then you pick a task. Like for example, generating melody, chord progressions or improvisation in a jazz style. But you can also re reverse that kind of approach where you choose a task and then you find a technique for that particular task. And that's what happened all the time across the history of generative music. Here's the taxonomy of different techniques for generative music. I have five high level categories, symbolic AI, optimization techniques, complex systems, statistical methods, and deep learning. The first four categories, I call them traditional. We've been using them when we or another for 50 plus years, and we've mainly used them in a symbolic capacity, so to generate symbolic scores. Over the last few years, we've been using also deep learning and all the news that you get on amazing new models that generate music or can sing, well, they all more or less use deep learning or a variation of it. And indeed, with these models, we've been able not only to generate a symbolic representation of music, but also directly working with an audio representation. This wasn't possible before, because the models weren't capable enough to handle this level of complexity or the level of complexity of audio representation. Now, let's dive into each of these categories at once and we'll start with, from symbolic AI. So, what is symbolic AI? Well, that's what we would also call good old-fashioned AI. So you have a lot of symbols and then you reason on those symbols and you manipulate those symbols in order to carry out an intelligent task. In our case, it's a creative task, is to create music. So we use a symbolic representation. We have like some symbols that can be mapped onto uh, meaningful musical entities and we can reason on those symbols and we can run algorithms that manipulate those symbols. But the, the core of symbolic AI, one way or another, is that we need to encode musical knowledge in rules. So we have to distill musical knowledge and put it in rules. For this reason, when we deal with symbolic AI for generative music, it is always advisable to have somebody who has a lot of understanding and knowledge of music theory so that they can distill rules for a particular style and use it to generate new music. Now, there are two ways we can use to uh, encode music. One is manual, and this is a super time-consuming process. It takes ages, or we can directly learn those rules from a corpus. And when we do that with symbolic AI, well, we're not really longer doing only symbolic AI, but there's also a sprinkle of machine learning in it because we are learning those rules directly from a corpus. Now, as I mentioned, encoding rules manually, identifying and encoding them is a super hassle. It is super time consuming. And the other issue is that it's gonna be very difficult to identify all the 
comprehensive rules that you need to um, kind of encapsulate a particular task for a particular task. It's a really difficult process. Here you have some example techniques, generative grammars that we're going to uh, dive into quite deeply in part two of this course, then constraint satisfaction and expert systems. So what is constraint satisfaction? Well, it's quite straightforward really. So basically you have a bunch of rules and these rules are all constraints and you want to create a solution. In our case, a solution obviously is a piece of music or whatever musical creation you want that enforces all of those constraints that satisfies all of them. And finally, we have expert systems. And here you basically have a knowledge base with all the rules for a particular creative task, compositional task. And then you're going to have a way of reasoning on using, leveraging those rules in order to create a solution through some a logic engine or something like that. Let me show you an amazing system that comes directly from the early 90s, late 80s. It's called Corral, and the inventor is Ipchoglu. Now, what does Corral do? Well, it creates or it generates Bach chorales or chorales in the style of Bach. This is an expert system. It has more than 300 rules and they've been all manually identified and encoded by a Choglu. And these rules cover all sorts of things, but mainly I would say the main factors are harmony and voice leading. Voice leading being like that aspect of music that covers how you move melodies, how you move a melodic idea. Right, so here you have an example uh, of a chorale in the style of Bach generated by chorale. Let's listen to this. Okay, so I've just like transcribed it in MuseCore and now we can listen to it. Okay, so that's a single expert. So if you want more, there's a paper here, the Corral paper, and in the appendix, you're gonna have more. It's extremely interesting to read this paper because you'll see how difficult it is to identify those rules and encode them. And you'll also realize that music doesn't follow rules strictly. So there's a lot of gray areas and ambiguity and it's very difficult to account for those. Okay, we move on to another breed of generative music techniques that's called optimization techniques. What are these? Well, the basic idea here is that you have a fitness function. It's basically a quality function that tells you how good the melody that your system ha has generated is and then you can use it as a way of scoring a solution and then to iteratively create a variation of that solution and then rescore it with the same fitness function again and again and again until you get to a point where the score function tells you, yeah, this is quite a good melody, that's it. Okay, so it's an iterative process and at each step you optimize using a scoring function that we call fitness function, especially in evolutionary genetic algorithms. Now, there's a problem here, isn't there? Well, the problem is that how do we create that fitness function? Because at the end of the day, a fitness function is a sort of like encapsulated function where we have all musical knowledge and musical information and we have a way of determining what's a good melody, what's a bad melody, if we're dealing with melody generation. And that's particularly hard, just as hard as coming up with rules, if not more, because giving a, an evaluation of a melody, for example, tends to be quite subjective. So finding a good fitness function is extremely hard. Now, with optimization techniques, we tend to have algorithms that imitate a particular target style, and that target style is obviously embedded 
in the fitness function. So for example, if I want to generate some improvisation in a Coltrane's jazz style, of course, I'm going to create a fitness function that encapsulates all of those elements that make that improvisation very, very Coltrane sounding. Okay. And so that information, that style is going to be already embedded in the fitness function. Now, these optimization techniques can be population-based. What does that mean? Well, rather than having a single solution that we optimize at every turn, we have a population, a lot of solutions, a lot of melodies, and we leverage them and we let them interact in order to have improved populations of melodies at each step. This is something that we do quite a lot in genetic algorithms, in evolutionary algorithms, where we have a population of solutions. And indeed, genetic algorithms are just one of the many optimization techniques that we can use for generating music. Others are particle swarm optimization or simulated annealing. I've used simulated annealing extensively for generating melodies, chords. This is, that is like a super cool algorithm, but I'm not gonna get into the details here. Now, in part two of the course, we're going to get in detail into genetic algorithms. But for now, let me just give you an example. It's called GenJam, and you can guess that it uses genetic algorithms. And this system was presented by Biles in 1994 for the first time, and it generates real-time jazz solos on top of accompaniment. And it uses an interactive genetic algorithm. So what is an interactive algorithm, genetic algorithm? Well, this is a smart way of avoiding that issue of finding the perfect fitness function because you, as a human being, are that fitness function. So the system generates some uh, solutions, you listen to them, and then you give the system a feedback and you are the fitness function in that point, at that point. And the system is going to learn from like, what you prefer and then adapt the next generation of solutions based off of what uh, you like or what you don't like. Okay, let's listen to a short passage generated by Jenjam. So you can hear that melodic line there on top. And below you have that standard jazz accompaniment. That is super cool. And there are a lot of examples on YouTube of GenJam. I highly suggest you to go check them out because it's quite amazing, this system. Let's see how GenJam works. So GenJam starts with a population of melodies, right? Then there's real-time human feedback. So here we have the human fitness function coming in and say, yeah, I do like this melody. I really don't like that melody. I do like this bar. I don't like that passage that much. Genjum realizes what you like and it uses some genetic operators and you'll understand what this is in part two of the course. Like for example, mutation or breeding together like different solutions in order to come up with a new breed of melodies, a new population of melodies that hopefully is going to be optimized based off of the uh, feedback that you gave to Genjam. Now, let's take a look at another category of generative music techniques. It's called complex systems. So what we do here is we use simple algorithms derived from the behavior of complex systems. Now, the advantage of this particular type of technique is that you don't need to encode music information or music knowledge at all into the, the algorithm itself. But that has also a disadvantage. And the disadvantage is that if you don't encode musical knowledge or you don't have the system learning and extracting musical knowledge from a corpus, the risk is that the output is not going to sound great. And indeed, usually the output of these complex systems doesn't sound great, but it is great for one particular purpose, and that is to inspire you as a composer. 
it, you just like get like these initial rough ideas and you can develop them if you want to. Some example techniques, fractals. You can use fractals, so you, uh, use like formulas for generating fractals and you can create music off of that. And that is gonna create some music that's very like self-similar and there's like something soothing about that type of music. Another technique is cellular automata. We're gonna dive deep into cellular automata in part two of the course and I'm gonna give you an example of a cellular automata system that generates music today. Okay. For this systems, it is extremely important to have a mapping that works well. You need a good mapping that can transfer whatever state of your complex system into something that's musically meaningful. Let me give you an example. In the case of a cellular automaton, you basically have a 2D grid with a lot of cells that can be in different states, like alive or dead. Now, this type of representation can't, it doesn't represent anything musical and what you have to do as a composer, as an engineer, as a researcher, whatever, is to find an interesting mapping between the states of the cells and the music. So you could map a cell onto a particular pitch, onto a particular duration, or onto a particular instrument, but you have to be clever at that because if you do it well, then you can get something interesting as raw material for your exp musical exploration, but otherwise you're gonna get like, just like pff, rubbish. Cool. Before we get into the uh, cellular automaton system that I want to show you, I have to introduce a particular type of cellular automaton called the Con Conway's Game of Life. And I need to do this because that system leverages this cellular automaton. So, what is Conway's Game of Life? Well, on a very high level, this algorithm tries to simulate life, but in a very simplified way. So you have like a 2D grid, and that is an environment, let's say, right? So in this 2D grid, you have a lot of cells, obviously, and each cell can be either in one of two states, either alive or dead. Now, this system works in discrete time steps. And at, it, at each time step, there, are certain, there is one rule that it is applied. And the rule is that a cell becomes alive if it has three neighbor cells that are alive themselves. And so you can apply this rule at every time step. And of course, this is gonna create a dynamic that's quite interesting. Also visually. Let's visualize Conway's game of life because it's quite the visual treat. Oh, there you go. How nice. So you see how they get alive and they die creating these cool patterns. Cool. Okay, but now from the visuals to the music. So as I promised, I'm gonna show you a system that uses come with game of life to generate music. This system is called CAMUS. It's an acronym for Cellular Automaton Music Generator. And it's been invented by Miranda in 1993. I studied this system quite extensively and, I, and it's quite dear to me, especially for the inventor Miranda, who was my external examiner at my PhD examination. So CAMUS works like this, it has two cellular automata that take care of two different aspects of music. So one that uses a Conway's Game of Life implementation is used to determine a pitch sequence, so melody basically, and another one is used for determining uh, the instrument. So it could be an organ, it could be a synthesizer, a guitar sound, whatever you want. So you use these two to generate music. Okay. Now, let's talk about the mapping. The mapping is quite strict, straightforward. Each cell in the 2D grid of the Conway's game of life that we use to determine pitch is going to be mapped onto a sequence of three pitches. That's it. That's a very straightforward implementation of this mapping. Now, Miranda himself has said that Camus generates quite poor output, but that's 
absolutely normal because as we said, there's no intelligence in this system, right? It's a simple algorithm, it's a mechanism. But he used it extensively for music inspiration because as I said, you can find things that are quite cool and you can use them as a, an initial step to get creative and create more stuff off of that. It could be rhythms, it could be melodic patterns. Let's listen to Camus in action for a second. Okay, really not the most interesting music ever, but still you can collect some musical bits here and there and then uh, develop them as a composer. Another category of techniques that we can use to generate music is what we can call statistical methods. This is a very primordial version of machine learning. Now, the basic idea here is that you can learn, you can extract patterns, rules directly from a corpus training your algorithm. And of course, if you do that, if you have algorithms that can learn from a corpus, you're gonna try to imitate a target style, the style of your data set. Now, the problem with this approach is that it struggles quite a lot with long-term dependencies. I want to remind you that these are quite primordial algorithms. They're not very capable at having, at extracting long-term dependencies and learning music on a very large scale. So what usually happens is that these methods tend to work quite well when you are on a small scale, but the moment you zoom out and you go to a larger scale, the scale of a section, it really doesn't work well because the music generated feels a little bit like a random walk. Now, what are some of these algorithms that we can use and we can call statistical methods? Well, it's Markov chains, Markov models. Markov chains is a topic that we are gonna cover in detail in part two of the course. But then we have also another technique that's slightly more advanced. It's a variation on Markov chains that's a sort of expansion on that idea that's called hidden Markov models. I want to show you an amazing example of a statistical method uh, kind of generative music system. It's called Continuator and it's been published by Paché, François Paché, who's a fantastic researcher in generative music. And the, this system is quite old. It's been published in 2002, but it still sounds quite impressive, as you'll hear in a second. Now, what is the continuator all about? Well, it allows you to uh, create music in an in interactive manner. And usually they've used it for improvising on piano. And what it does, it, it learns on the fly the performer's style and then it responds, hence the name continuator, based off of whatever style the, the performer, the piano performer has. And for doing all of that, it leverages some mark of chains uh, algorithms. Okay, let's take a look at the continuator in action. idea with a variation very nice very subtle wow it's quite cool again there are a lot of videos of the continuator online on YouTube check them out how does it work though well it works in multiple steps as we saw there's the performer who plays the piano and then the continuator analyzes the musical phrases performed by the pianist and it tries to extract meaningful patterns directly from those phrases and it stores those patterns in a sort of like statistical representation. These two steps 
we can call them the learning phase. And the cool thing about Continuator is that it learns in real time. It's on the fly, it's super quick. And that's a fantastic advantage for such an interactive compositional system. And finally, the last step is that Continuator leverages those stored patterns in a statistical representation, and then it generates a response, an answer, a musical answer, using a probabilistic approach. Okay, you folks, we've reached the deep learning category. And as we know, this is wild. These deep learning systems have demonstrated that they are very, very powerful. Now, at the core of deep learning, we have an algorithm called artificial neural network. And the idea of using a neural network for generating music is not something like that has popped up yesterday or five years ago. Neural networks have been around for decades and decades, but they haven't always worked really well. But nonetheless, there have been generative music researchers who've used them already in the 80s to generate music, melodies, chord progressions, what have you. The problem though, is that they didn't really work that great. And this is not a specific case to music though. We had the very same problem using artificial intelligence for all sorts of other tasks, for example, in image recognition and other things. And why was that the case? Well, we had the technology, but we lacked a couple of things. First, enough computation to train huge models, and two, enough data. So what happened over the last decade or so is that we now have incredible access to incredibly powerful GPU uh, computation and also we have access to massive data sets and that's the same thing for music and that's why we're now seeing incredibly powerful deep learning based generative music models. Now, Deep learning models learn from massive data sets. They extract information. They extract all of those rules by themselves. And of course, they try to imitate a target style. And that target style is the style of the data set. Because at the end of the day, they're trying to understand the patterns and the nuances that make up a certain musical style. The good thing about deep learning is that we can use it not only to generate in a symbolic domain, but also directly in the audio domain. And that's the first time we can do something like this with this level of efficiency. And the reason is because these systems are powerful and they allow us to treat very high dimensional representation of music like audio. Cool. The problem with deep learning though is that these algorithms tend to be quite computationally demanding and you need a lot of data to train them. But the great thing about it is that they usually are able to learn long, longer or longish term uh, dependencies. This is still a problem as we'll see in the next video where we're gonna look at limitations and future prospects for research in generative music. Finally, a point uh, that's very peculiar to deep learning is that you don't need almost any manual input. And the reason is because the models are gonna be able to extract all the information they need directly from the data, or at least like, that's the promise, that's the hope that you have as a researcher. And what this means is that uh, you don't need to, let, or to teach the model about key, about time signature, about scales, about pitch, all of these things, because all of that information will be extracted automatically by the model itself. Now, this is a good thing on the one end, but on the other is not necessarily super great, and we'll see why that's the case in the next video, so don't miss that. Cool. Now, deep learning and artificial networks come in many different shades and colors. Of course, the main algorithm is still an artificial neural network, but there are many different types, variants of artificial networks, or as we call them, different architectures. So here I have four architectures that have been extensively used for generating um, music. Recurrent neural networks, like uh, long short-term memory networks, that is a specific case of an RNN or recurring neural network. Then you have variational autoencoders, diffusion models and transformers. There you also have an example for each of the different architectures. Deepbach for RNNs, Jukebox for VAEs, Refusion for diffusion models and MusicGen 
or even music LM for transformers. Now, Deep Bach is the only system that operates in a symbolic domain. All the others operate in audio. And this is not a case because up until a certain point, we were still mainly focusing on symbolic generation. But then all of a sudden we realized that we can also directly generate audio. And over the last few years, we've seen an incredible influx of audio based generative models for music. Now, in this course, I'm going to be covering two of these architectures, diffusion models, and in particular refusion and transformers, and in particular music gen. I'm not going to cover recurrent neural nets and variational autoencoders. And if you are wondering why, the reason is because I have two playlists. One playlist where I use RNNs, recurrent neural networks for generating melodies, and a whole other series dedicated to generate sound with variational autoencoders. So uh, you can definitely check them out. Let's take a quick look at Deep Bach. Now, Deep Bach, not surprisingly, uses deep learning to generate Bach chorales. And how does that work? Well, it works in this way, in this visual way. Of course, this is a very, very high level representation of it, but you get the gist. So you get all the chorales from Bach, you feed them into this neural network, and then this neural network hopefully will learn what it means to create, to compose a Bach chorale, and it will gen generate new chorales in the style of Bach. Now, I wanted to use this example here for a particular reason, because it is basically the other side of the moon of the system called chorale, the symbolic AI system that we covered at the beginning of this video. Why is that the case? Well, in that case, if you remember, the researcher had to encode more than 300 rules manually in order to create that system. Whereas in this case, researchers have done nothing in terms of musicology there. They haven't extracted those rules and encoded them. Deep Bach does that just by itself. Okay, let's listen to a result of this generations. Yeah, it's actually quite nice, the result there. It's quite convincing. Also, this human performance was really, really good on, I believe, a recorder instrument. By now, we've covered a lot of different algorithms that you can use to generate music. But an important uh, takeaway point here is that there isn't a single algorithm that rules them all, that is perfect and that can solve generative music. This is also true for deep learning models. Of course, they are powerful, but they're not perfect. Different algorithms may be ideal for different tasks. They have pros and cons. And sometimes the best thing you can do in a production setting is to combine multiple techniques together so that you can minimize the weaknesses of each algorithm and highlight the strengths. And this is something that I've done time and again. We've covered a lot of terrain today, but there's so much more that you can learn if you want to. Here, I just want to give you a couple of fantastic articles. These are reviews of two things. On the left, you have a review article about traditional um, generative music techniques. On the right, you have an amazing review of contemporary deep learning techniques for music generation. I also want to share this amazing website called Deep Learning for Music Generation. Here you'll find a lot of information about uh, deep learning for generative music. So as you can see here in this table of contents, you have um, a review of different neural network architectures. Here you have uh, all papers and information about deep learning models for symbolic music generation and down here for audio generation. And there's also other stuff 
a lot of goods here, like data sets, journals, conferences, authors, and more and more. We've made it until the end of today's video, but before we finish off, I just want to remind you about the main points that we covered here. First, generative music uses a lot of different techniques, and we can organize them into a taxonomy made up of five different categories. Symbolic AI, optimization, complex systems, statistical methods, and deep learning. Finally, a very important point here, just rem remember that there isn't a single system, a single technique that works for all sorts of tasks in generative music. Different models, different systems, different techniques have different pros and cons. Thank you very much for staying until now. Before I dash off, I just want to remind you about the Sound of AI Slack community. There you'll find 8,000 plus people super interested in all things at the intersection of music and artificial intelligence. And there we also have a dedicated channel to this course called Generative Music AI Course, where you can ask a lot of questions and get a lot of feedback. I'll leave you the link to join the community in the description box. Now that you have a good understanding of generative techniques, in the next video, we're gonna take a look at the limitations of current techniques and what we can do in order to overcome these limitations in the future. Final thing, please leave a like and consider subscribing if you're not a subscriber of the Sound of AI channel. That's all for today. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.